Good morning. So today I'm, I'm going to introduce you to a whole biological realm that you probably don't often think about, and yet it, it is really, is, is sound good. I, got, I have to work out where I should be standing in relationship to this mic. That you probably don't really think about, but really plays an important role in both helping plants resist disease and as a, as a primary way that you can get supplemental nutrition into the plant. So you've heard of foliar feeding, but the way that's been presented, at least for me in, in learning about it, is so far from the reality of what actually takes place. And so as I explained yesterday in the orchard intensive, I do many different things with holistic sprays to build system health. And, and today, I'm going to broaden that perspective to include market gardeners and those who are growing forage crops. It's, it's, it's integral to healthy landscaping. There, there's everything I'm talking about today is totally applicable across all growing spectrums. And I think we're going to have some fun with this. So as below, so above. The traditional wisdom puts that the other way as above, so below, and that's how we started to think about life in the soil. But now that we're, we're all starting to have a little bit more of a rudimentary understanding of the soil food web, I'm going to bring that knowledge and rise up into the arboreal sphere where many of the same microbes can be found. And knowing what we know about the soil food web, we're going to extrapolate some of that way of being between microbes to their arboreal food web and, and start to understand this interconnection between the organisms and plants. It, it's, this interconnection is so key to plant health. So, I don't know, what was it, 20 some years ago, even 30 years ago, the, the movie The Matrix came out? And so some of you have seen The Matrix. You know, we're, we're entering another realm. We can't see it. You have to imagine it. You have to intuit it. But when you start to make it your own, it'll become part of your, your growing, your perspective on, on how to go about growing. So the arboreal food web, when I, when I use that term, um, I'm certainly mimicking the soil food web idea, the compost food web idea. It consists of, of fungi and bacteria that live both within the plant cells, within the leaf, within the stem, within the cambium cells of a more woodsy species. Um, and these are all known as, as endophytes. So there's endophytic bacteria, endophytic fungi. And then on the surface of the plant, that's a whole other part of the story. And here, the bacteria and the fungi are considered epiphytes. So those are our two new words for the day. We're, we're done with new words now. And this presence of microorganisms, both on the surface of plants and within the plants, is the rule is, is the norm. It's, it's, it's rare that there would be no colonization by microbes on the plant surface at all. And this totally makes sense if you think about the root zone. We, we talk about the rhizosphere and how microbe eating microbe releases nutrients and that's where a good part of plant nutrition comes from. So we're just we're bringing it up top and those are our two words. And, and plants from the very get-go have this affiliation because endophytic fungi spores and endophytic bacterial endospores are in the seeds. It's through the seed that this connection begins. The plant grows and it, it picks up friends both in the air, on the arboreal parts, and the root zone gets populated. Uh, I'll be speaking later today about mycorrhizal fungi. The, the fungi that actually penetrate into the roots of plants and, and bring balanced nutrition to the plant. This, this notion of bringing it up is, is just building on that. So, so what happens? What do endophytic fungi and bacteria do? They have the capacity to biosynthesize plant hormones. So hormones are used in many different stages of growth, and, and the microbes are just assisting the plants achieve that. They are by their very presence in the plant, triggering a phytochemical response 
that doesn't repel them like it would disease, but it still puts the plant into a, a sense of heightened awareness. This is known as induced systemic resistance. So the microbes are contributing in that sense. And then there is this whole new way of thinking about how nutrients get moved into the plant. So again, we're going to start with basics and we're thinking the root zone, the root absorbs nutrition, the mycorrhizal fungi bring nutrition to the plant through the roots. But the plants can also absorb nutrition from above. And as growers, and particularly growers who are working with annual crops or have that short charge of time to get the job done, or in my case with perennial crops, where because the apple tree is out there throughout the whole growing season, there's a succession of different diseases that come on. It's really good to be aware of how can we help beef up a plant for those more critical times. Endophytes are especially helpful at helping plants deal with extreme stresses. So here I'm talking about high temperatures. I'm talking about salt stress, um, heavy metal stress, drought. And that's a key part of the scene as well, because there's more and more stresses on plants. So having knowledge that this, these other organisms play a key role in making plants do what they do. You know, again, this is, this is a shift for human beings to think about what we see as an individual plant and recognize it more as a community adjoining of the plant with the micro realm. So the leaf surface of the plants represent probably the largest microbial habitat that there is. There's a lot of leaves out there photosynthesizing. And on the surface of those leaves, what I call referred to as the epiphytes, um, live outside the cuticle, the waxy covering of the surface of the leaf and on the fruit. Well, this includes yeast and fungi and protozoa and nematodes at times. And they depend on nutrients that are either coming about that will fall out of the atmosphere, exuded from the leaf, microbe eating microbe, but it, it's a limited nutrient resource source. And that's another piece of the puzzle. Sometimes what we're doing when we spray foliar nutrients, that, that additive foliar is trying to make it sound like it's for the leaf. Sometimes it's really for the arboreal life community that's on the surface of the leaf because they in turn enter in other things. Now, fungi and bacteria work together. And bacteria essentially through their organic acids and help, help make nutrients soluble, which fungi take up. So that, that collaboration is an important element. We're, again, remember, we're not seeing any of this. It's, it's invisible to our eye, but it's so, so, so relevant. So let's just start with our idea of what happens in the root zone. Um, right now we're talking about a root, root off of which are our small feeder roots, roots and, and left alone the their own device right 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 a root system, system, system can only can take only in, in nutrients, nutrients brought to it to a capillary action by the groundwater. And, and essentially, essentially only within then about three quarters of an inch around the ground that surface. surface. So but this model, model I, I, I essentially I think of this as this is kind of working kind of like short straws, straws to suck up, up, up kind of basically a soda, so, um, um, and, and, you know, not, yeah, not really, really deep nutrition going on here. On here. This, this, this notion of totally fits, fits what, what happens, happens in NPK agriculture, and soluble chemical fertilization. It's soluble nutrients, soluble ions, it's not complex nutrition, and the plant plant can grow, thrive, but it is not set up that it really resists it easily, so we have to medicate with fungicides, with agricultural chemicals to get to those problems to get a product. That's the familiar plateau that conventional agriculture helps us on. Um, um, back in back the 1930s and 40s, people, people, people like, like Sir Albert Howard, Howard Lady E. Balfour, Howard, started to talk about how, how plants don't just take, just take up the attention of soluble ions. It's, it's more and more complex than that, and it involves biology. These, these are some of the pioneers of the organic agriculture movement. They're working with J.I. Rodeo, set up so we know 
we know is there in the agriculture. But, but they, were they were really pointing out, pointing out you know, the living soil, soil that, that makes, makes plant, plant healthy, healthy and, and creates food, 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 food so much better, better for, us. for us. So now we're now leaving, leaving that, that straw mentality behind. And, and, and I'm, I'm just, just establishing the idea, the idea that, that to share, share protoplasm, bundle system, system, and plant sap. sap. This is how my horizon guy and I work, work with plants, plants, plants take part in carbon sugar, change, 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 when people, when people talk about, talk about all your all eating, eating, at its really most really simple, simple, simple level, level, level um, um, you'll hear you'll hear read about, about ideas, ideas like, like get out there early, early in the morning, morning or wait or wait until the sun is starting to go down, down, down and cool off, off because, because at that, at that time, time of day, day, day both ends of, ends of the day, day, day but not the, not the high heat of the noon hour. It's at that time of day when the Mata Mata the leaf the respiration cells, cells that and the side of the leaf are open, open and can take and take nutrients. nutrients. So, so if, if you've done, if you've done a new spray, you probably, probably heard, heard that, heard that idea. idea. Now, now, there's some there's validity, validity to that, to that but it's it a much more extensive scene than, than that. And, and, and I'm going to do something, do something I, don't I don't normally, normally do. You know, when, you know, when I've learned, I've learned that when you make PowerPoint power slides, slides, you don't, you don't want to show me three words, words, you want to keep it on the gauge and a few words, words, you know what I mean, let me get But the reason, the reason I don't show you three words, words, is because I can't, I can't remember all this. I can, can now, but now they're there, I have to look down, down. But if I look back, look back at that cuticle, think of that like that, like a muscle. And we accept the idea that it opens, closes, closes. So, so round, round, that cuticle, cuticle, there are, are, are cells, cells that are basically, that are basically the, hinges the hinges of what opens open 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 the door. And, and there's a flexibility, flexibility to, that. to that. So, so it isn't so much, so much to the pseudo-made opening, opening that nutrients go in, go in, but it's but through, through the micro-micros micro that are in that flexible, flexible aspect, aspect of plant, plant tissue. tissue. And through those, through those micros, or, um, um, because they're lying line, line to get in the charge charges, it's primarily, primarily positive, positive charge, charge nutrients, nutrients that can enter and enter that, that medium. medium. So here so we're, talking we're talking about things like a nitrogen, nitrogen, nitrogen in ammonia, ammonia form, form, calcium, calcium, potassium, potassium magnesium, magnesium. And on the and other, hand, other hand, anions, those, those are nutrients that have negative, negative charge. charge. Now we're talking, we're talking about nitrogen, nitrogen, nitrate, nitrate form, form, phosphate, phosphate and sulfate are not as likely, as likely to be absorbed or the microbes. Micro so, so, so that, that max maximum of the brain or brain late is still, still applies. applies. But, but we're, we're starting, we're starting now, now a little bit more specific of, of why, why your calcium, calcium, calcium and work, and work. But if I try to, try to, uh, Get phosphorus, get phosphorus in my plant, not that's not the medium. The phosphorus, phosphorus is going to come through the root. So we have a little, so have a little, little bit of a basis of what we're choosing to do. To do. Now, on now, the surface of the plant, is this wax wax of the so this is a picture of the cuticle on the apple, on the apple, the apple, the apple fruit itself. itself. And, and and each plant, each plant is different, like the snow snowflakes. It's when you start to start to have, you know, you know, we. In one sense, in one sense we, we live in a very, very amazing time, time, time in that through electric, through electric, through electric, electronic scanning microscope, microscope, we can see, see images, images, images of stuff, stuff that we couldn't ever, ever imagine. imagine. And, 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 and it really, really opens up more and more understanding. understanding. The images that we really built help us, help us see what's see going, going on. on. And, and this is a this place, is a place where, where exit, exit it from the plant, plant feed, feed, the micro microbes are on the surface of the plant, micro microbes find, find a place to hide, hide. but there's still, there's still separation. separation, part of the part job, job of the cuticle of plant, plant, plant is to keep the water, water within, within the plant, so, so it's, it's a barrier, barrier in its own sense, it isn't like, it's like nutrients just need it, need it and get in there, there's, there's, there's micro microspores I just talked about, now I'm going to extract it rapidly, one of the lessons about have a fungal mycelium, mycelium I do, I do have the longer straws, straws high size of what's going, going on nutritionally on the surface of the plant. And that, and that is, 
at the end of, end of the day, on the fungi that can be found, found in the cambium, found in the blade of grass. They're living, they're living with stem cells, cells that the hyphae poke out, 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 and the, the, the hyphae, just like the in the soil, the soil are the, are the main, main media by which, by which nutrients, nutrients can, can be absorbed by the plant. plant. Now, now, one of the things, things I have heard, I've heard for a long time, and you've probably, probably heard a similar thing, it is, it is it's far, it's far better, better to correct, correct nutrient balance balances in the soil, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying it's, saying it's not. And that, and that all you're feeding is making, making, making up for some fish and you don't have quite right, right soil, soil yet, yet, so that's why, that's you, go why you go about doing that. And in, in a way, way it is helping growers back, 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 back to the idea, idea of nutritional sprays, because, because well, you're, you're, you're doing, you're doing that to fail down, down here. You might get everything, everything right right the way you way should. I've totally flipped that around and come to see that my main, my main job in the soil, and we'll, and get, we'll get into that a little bit more in the next workshop. workshop. My main my job, main job there down there is not to not go through up the biology. That's, that's, that's kind of really, really, really nice to know that. <laughs> all the all burden, burden is on under the real, real intelligence is in the soil. soil. My, job, my job is to support, support that. that. And then, then I'm here, here as a human, human growing, growing a crop, crop, working, working with the farm system that I am. And my main job up here. Again, again, not screwing it up is important. We'll, we'll talk, talk about, about how like, we might screw it up. But more but so, more so it's it's to understand how plants, plants, plants can take a nutrition at a critical point in their growth cycle. That, that can then enable me to successfully grow a crop without, without chemicals to compensate for nutrition, nutritional or biological deficiencies. So I, I, I actually have, in my opinion, more more of a role up top, top, working with the arboreal microbes than I do, than I do below. down below. There are, there are things I do. I make compost. We're going to look at that in the next workshop. workshop. I grow cover crops. Cover crops. All, that's All that's important, too. But, but we've overlooked, we've overlooked that, that rather than, rather than medicating for disease or pest issues, issues how much better, better, better to supplement, supplement certain, certain mineral nutrition when it's really, really needed to do, do so in a way that works with or a boreal biology, which is in place if we don't destroy it. I mean, that's, that's taking me like 30 years to be able to articulate, articulate that. I think it's like, you know, you slowly, slowly nudge your way to that, that kind of thing. So Charles, Charles Walters, Walters, who started, started Acres, Acres Magazine, magazine. some of you have probably been to an Acres conference, um, spoke about, about how plants in touch, in touch with balanced nutrition um, um, that's, the that's the basis for being able to resist pests and, and disease. So when, when I talk about the mycorrhizal fungi realm, you know, you know a key part of that is direct directing direct nutrients to different, different plants in the community so that every plant is getting balanced nutrition. nutrition. Similarly, when I, when I think about the nutrients, nutrients are going to be absorbed by the surface of the plant, it isn't going to direct nutrient, the plant sucks it in. It's not a short, strong thing. It goes, it goes through the mechanism, mechanism of the doings of the biology living on the surface of the plant. So and so when I spray early in the morning, in the morning they're going to make this a little more human sounding, <laughs> and I'm thinking stomata open, absorbing that nutrient, absorbing that calcium. In truth, what happens is that, is that nutrient is, is there on the surface of the plant, taken into the crevices of the cuticle. It's absorbed by bacteria, which in which turn, turn make it available to the fungi to deliver it. It doesn't just happen in that two hours after you spray the nutrient spray. It's over the next several days. So, so now we're starting to think a little bit more ongoing, a little bit more extensively. Just like the soil food web, we don't put down, say, kelp meal and think it has two hours to be absorbed. We know it has to be broken down, made into bioavailable constituents, and then absorbed. So it's pretty cool to start thinking about that's in place with our boreal biology. So I'm, I'm going to run through some basics that lead to effective foliar feeding of the biology on the surface of the plant, which in turn feeds the plant. So I, I, I've thrown out some sentences now that have really flipped what you might have learned as we're going into a new approach to this. So one of the things that's important with when we get into 
what I call the holistic spray, making fermented plant extracts using local plants to create a nutrient brew to apply to our crops, is the idea of chelation. The idea that <coughs> we can get nutrients from a plant absorbed from an herb, from a medicinal plant, absorbed into a tea, which we can then apply on the surface of the plant. And those nutrients might be locked away in the molecule, but on the other hand, if we're aware of what chelation involves, and this is primarily done with the use of a humid, humic acid product, um, chelation essentially keeps that nutrient at a transferable site where the biology can pick it up to offer it to the plant. So there's a way to do this where you lock up the nutrients you think that you're offering, whereas if you're a little bit aware of, of the humic acid piece, and, and you'll see that I, I utilize humic acid at a few specific points in the process, what I'm basically doing is setting up a molecule where in this case <coughs> that copper ion can be obtained by the plant. <coughs> And otherwise, it would be locked away and, and wash off and be lost to the plant. So all of this is aimed at <coughs> that whole notion of induced systemic resistance. So I, I went into detail with this yesterday, but the basic idea here is that whereas I have an immune system based on red blood cells and lymphocytes, plants respond to environmental reality and to certain foliar elicitors by producing phytochemicals that there's this whole evolutionary thing going. A, a fungal spore lands on a leaf, it sends out a hyphae, it has to produce enzymes to punch its way into the leaf cell, and that, that's the beginning of an infection. And the plant counters that with effector proteins and, and, and other hormones so that the fungal disease strategy doesn't work. So this is ongoing, it's been happening since forever. And, and if we work with that, we get to the point where we can recognize that certain spray materials, besides having a nutritional component, are going to induce that systemic resistance response. So I'm, I'm really looking to build the health of the system, make plants as healthy as I can, by recognizing how they do it if humans weren't involved. So I'm, I'm just trying to supplement what plants know how to do. So all sorts of things work for this purpose. Microbes, um, whether that's a specific bacterial application or it's something like effective microbes or compost tea, that's a component of what you're doing. With the microbes com comes another piece, and that's what I call competitive colonization, biological reinforcement, and we'll look at that in a minute. But also I'm looking at like herbal constituents that are going to stimulate that immune response. That's like, like herbal medicine. I take a tincture. With the plant, I put terpenoids or flavonoids into a spray mix, and that in turn is going to stimulate more of that action. Um, mineral nutrition, like seaweed, kelp extracts, are going to stimulate this response. Dehydrated ocean water, which is filled with nutrients, is going to stimulate this response. So a lot of this sounds fairly benign. This is not organophosphates. This is not systemic fungicides. This is foodstuffs. This is microbes and foodstuffs. One of the people I learned a lot from is Jerry Brunetti. So some of you maybe have heard Jerry speak in conferences. He, he's passed on. I, Akers published, his last book was called The Farm as Ecosystem, which is a really helpful book, you know, establishing some of these concepts that I'm sharing with you. And one of the things Jerry said was that it's multiple mechanisms that works best. So not just spraying seaweed, but spraying seaweed with some biology and, and maybe some fatty acids gets a much more, a deeper response, a stronger response in terms of resisting disease. So let me go back now to that, that idea of the biology. Out <coughs> in the environment, there's a lot of stresses that can make it hard to, to persist. And so arboreal biology can peter out. On the other hand, 
when we include a biology component in a holistic spray or a nutrient brew, we are repopulating the numbers. And if those numbers are on the order of 70% or more, that's, in another, that's another important way that a disease pathogen, be it fungal, be it bacterial, is prevented from causing an infection in the plant. So keeping that canopy colonization up at a strong high level is also important. Many things can work against colonization. Uh, it can be strong at one point in the season, but eventually high heat, acid rain, um, ozone depletion, really cold, deep cold spell is going to knock back microbe numbers. And this is part of what happens when the growing season goes on and then we have a rainy spell and there's lots of release of fungal disease spores and the numbers just aren't there to counter it. So, so plants are working with both epiphytic organisms on their surface to stop disease and also within through phytochemicals to stop disease. Then there's things that we choose to do, the use of fungicides. You know, fungicides are sprayed to kill the disease pathogen. They're also killing those endophytic fungi reaching out to bring nutrients into the plant. They're dripping onto the soil. They're killing the sapotrophic fungi that break down organic matter. They're killing the mycorrhizal fungi that bring nutrients to the plant. If, if you think about it from a biology perspective, you know, often, <coughs> I'm up here and I, I don't know who's farming how in this group. I know you're here and, and so you have the interest and, and that's wonderful. But I don't know who's farming how and, and, and I'm not interested in saying you're using glyphosate, you're using Roundup, um, you're using NPK fertilizer, nitrate fertilization. Um, I'm not interested in that. I, what I'm trying to do is just speak for the biology and I want you to hear it and maybe see that there is another way and then start to adapt. This could fit my growing system. This would help me with the powdery mildew situation I have in my cucurbits because you're starting to think essentially like a plant, like a plant with lots of friends. And again, we all hear this in the way we want to, but obviously spraying fungicides to take care of disease has issues for all the allies that we really should be working with. Um, and then there's the fact, again, that food resources can run out for the arboreal community. So there are ways that I can s supplement that, make sure that there's some foodstuffs out there so the microbes can persist. This is the picture of the underside of a leaf. And on this leaf, you see the, the, the vein of the leaf, and you see some, they look kind of like the towers of Mordor, but th those are our little leaf hairs. And also within there, you can zoom in and see the individual epidermal cells and also the stomata. And if we magnify yet again and look at what's going on on the surface of just one cell, what we will see in a competitive colonization context is all sorts of microbes there. So the pill-shaped ones <coughs> are bacteria. They might be best bacillus subtilis, they might be lactobacilli, they all play different roles, diversity is good here. And, and the more blob-like shapes with, surrounded by white threads, those are yeasts, which are unicellular fungi. So the threads are their hyphae. Um, but that's what I mean by 70% colonization. If you're a disease spore and you land in the midst of that with the idea of I'll get my hyphae into that cell and I'll cause an infection and then that farmer won't be able to sell his crop because it'll be all ruined by fungal disease. Well, that doesn't happen because microbe eats microbe. These microbes have used some of the resources that disease spore needed. And more, most telling of all is microbes protect their niche by creating antimicrobial compounds, antibiotics, um, antifungal compounds to resist the pathogen in order so the benign microbe can stay in place. So lactobacilli, I utilize a lot, and we're going to see how. how. Um, they do that really well. You know that. If you make sauerkraut or you eat pickles, 
that food is preserved because lactobacilli have preserved the niche of that organism in that foodstuff. They do the same thing. Many of these benign bacteria and working in concert with fungi do the same thing. So that's what it looks like, 70% colonization. Now, Elaine Ingham, um, some of you have heard of her. She's done a lot to help people understand more about the soil food web and also has taught about compost tea. Talks about how, you know, we know 5% of the names of these different critters. It's not important that we identify all who's who. It's complex. Maybe it's beyond our ability to even understand. What we just need to appreciate is that in diversity, letting the microbe, microbial intelligence make the final decisions, that's where plants work. That's where answers lie. Now, I'm repeating a few slides from yesterday. This is a good one. This is what I call my NRA moment. Again, there I am, right on the edge of being political. But I'm not being political. <laughs> what I'm going to tell you is that it's not the sprayer that kills. It's what you put in the sprayer. My point here is people come at me and say, well, I would grow fruit, but I don't want to spray. It's like, no, it's about what you put in the sprayer. Sure, I don't want to spray toxins. I'm not spraying herbicide, I know what it does to the soil life, but the sprayer itself, whether it's a backpack sprayer or a tractor-mounted sprayer, whether you're working with it in, in row crops, growing corn and seed soybeans, it, what counts is what you put in the sprayer. The sprayer is just the tool, so get over that part, because we need this tool to do some of the things I'm going to talk about. The active ingredients in a holistic spray aimed at building system health, building both plant health, inducing that systemic resistance response, but also building the health of this arboreal food web, are trace minerals, fatty acids, and microbe diversity. And I'm going to just super quickly go through the four ingredients in what I call the holistic core recipe. And again, remember Jerry Brunetti's idea that multiple mechanisms are really what makes this Hum. So we're going to look at seed oils, um, we're going to look at what's known as fish hydrolysate and make sure you understand the nuance there, seaweed and what kelp, the kelp plant does from the ocean for land plants, and some version of microbial inoculant. So one of the primary seed oils that I utilize in orcharding is pure neem oil. So neem oil is pressed from the seeds of the Azer tree, which grows in India, Southeast Asia, North Africa, South Florida, Southern California. Neem is unique in that it contains compounds called Azer that inhibit the molting cycle of insects, but it also contains terpenoids. That's one of those herbal medicine words that have to do with resistance metabolites. And it also contains these fats the value of which is feeding their arboreal microbes. The fats have some value, they're absorbed by the plant probably as well, but not immediately, it's through the microbes. Again, just that idea, it's, it goes through the microbes before it gets to the plant. Um, but the azodiractins have a lot of merit if you're working in an orchard scenario and, and you're trying to knock back moth populations and certain other foliar feeders, and I won't get into the depths of that. Um, you may not have an insect issue, and, and neem may not be the, is not the only choice, but it, it has so much merit that I talk about it. And I, I do want to emphasize that first word, pure. I'm talking about 100% neem oil, non-adulterated. It hasn't been extracted from pure neem oil and called 70% neem oil. It's not the neem products you see in the farm store or in catalogs where the azodiractins have been extracted away from the fats to make it more convenient and more profitable for the companies that make those products. I want the real thing, because I want the fats. And you'll learn, whether you read in my books or you read on my websites, that to work with fats, to get them into water, to be able to spray, you need to emulsify them. And, and that's just basically adding a small proportion of biodegradable soap so the soap can help the fat 
pipes and the oils distributed in the water so you in turn when you're spraying are not just throwing out globules but it's broken down into smaller bits to be applied to the surface of the leaf. Another seed oil I use is Karanja, which is again not a native North American plant but it comes from the Indian subcontinent and it's the Indian beech tree. But Karanja has flavonoids. It makes neem mix a little bit easier. I get it from the same source. This woman in Minnesota, the neemresource.com was on the, the previous slide. And it just gives me some room to play. But, but again, it, it, it also contributes yet another mechanism. One of these days, when we get over this whole marijuana hemp thing and let everyone grow industrial hemp um, for fiber, there's going to be a huge amount of hemp seeds. And there's some of this now, and you pay a lot for hemp seed oil, but hemp seed oil contains the same fats I'm talking about in the neem and the karanja. So again, there's, there's different sources. Right now it's too expensive. I'm not gonna go grow apples by buying one ounce bottles of hemp seed oil. But someday it's gonna be more available. Um, similarly, I'm, I'm gonna reference milk, whey, Dairy products also contain these same kinds of fats that can really make the microbe community thrive. The fish piece. When I say liquid fish, that's open to a wide range of interpretation. When I say cold process fish hydrolysate, I'm being very specific about a fish product that contains the fish oils and the enzymes and the hormones that are food for the biology. And liquid fish, um, sometimes you also hear this called fish fertilizer. When fish is processed and the fish oil removed, so you can buy a fish oil product in the health food store or what have you, and the remaining fish is pasteurized and heated, you get a product which in truth is called fish emulsion. It's liquid, but it's fish emulsion. And, and, and that has some value for greening up lettuce seedlings in the greenhouse, but that's about it. You really want the whole fish product where the oils are still there because it's, it's those fats that are, are what really have the merit in terms of buying a fish product. And, and one of the ways that you can distinguish this, so I'm talking about brands like Organic Gem, Neptune's Harvet, Harvest, um, Dram's Fisheries up in Michigan, um, Schaefer's Fisheries in Illinois, um, Brown's in Tennessee, I forget the name of the, the one on the, the Pacific Coast, um, but the companies that offer the true fish hydrolysate, it's really easy to tell. You don't even have to read their, their marketing jingos because that can lead to confusion. But because it's a fertilizer, it has an NPK number on the, n the label, giving the percent content of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And the first number is the nitrogen number. And when that number is two or three, you are buying a true fish hydrolysate. When that number is four or five, or spiked up to as high as 20 to make you like, oh, super nitrogen, this is great. That's a fish emulsion with synthetic nitrogen even added to get that end number really high. So that alone is going to tell you that distinction where you're getting something that's a true biological benefit. The kelp plant can come to us either as seaweed extract, a dried powder, or as a cold process liquid kelp. And in all but one respect, it doesn't make any difference. So for the most part, I buy a, a dried seaweed extract. I get it from North Country Organics in Vermont. And I get, well, it's a big box. And it costs like $300, but it lasts like, in my case, like three or four years. I try to buy in bulk, and I have an understanding of what lasts and what doesn't. So like with liquid fish, I know it's going to keep well for two years but I'm not going to buy a three or four year supply because it starts to get awfully smelly on the far end. And, and so even I have limits and some of this biological stuff. Um, but the difference between the dried extract and the liquid kelp is that 
The cold processed kelp retains the polysaccharide component. So these are the complex sugars in the kelp plant. And that in turn, when sprayed onto plants, the afternoon, the, the late morning before a predicted freeze. So you might be thinking frost on tomatoes, or you might be thinking 28 degrees on apple blossoms will kill 10% of the flowers, but at 25 degrees, you're going to lose 90% of the flowers. Kelp acts as a, liquid kelp acts as a plant antifreeze, and it increases the cold hardiness by two to four degrees of those plant tissues that absorb these sugars. So that's a, a very functional spring tool to be aware of, depending what you're growing. Just know that liquid kelp might help you make the difference between loss of crop and retaining that crop. You know, if, if the temperature is dropping down into the teens, it's, it's a good year to take off and, and just go do some other things. But you, you, have, you have an ability to play with that to help. But the main thing in seaweed uh, in kelp are the cytokinins, the hormones that help the kelp plant hold fast to the bottom of the sea, in turn have merits in terms of growing crops. Part of this is about flavonoid content, again, a different mechanism than what I was talking about with the neem, the terpenoids. Um, and the flavonoid piece has real effectiveness against bacterial disease. So that's the kind of knowledge I use in deciding what I'm spraying at different times in the orchard season. But I'll just give you that context. The microbes, for me, I currently work primarily with the Terraganics product called EM1. So effective microorganisms are an idea that came from the Japanese natural farming movement. And a man named Dr. Higa selected certain groups of organisms, and we'll look at that in just a bit, that had a facultative nature. That means that they can both work in an anaerobic environment, but also in an aerobic environment, which gives us, as growers, a lot of it, of, it gives us the ability to brew a mother culture to activate it in order to get more volume. So it, it can be very economical. I, I buy a five gallon, container of EM1. The cost is about $250 plus shipping, which is a lot for what it is. But when I add some blackstrap molasses, I make that five gallons into 110 gallons of microbe brew. That is enough for me to work my three acres of orchard and our gardens and some of the cover cropped areas where, like for instance, this holistic spray in my mind has a lot of value when I spray oats I'm growing oats because I'm going to harvest the green seed. It's called the milky oats, and it's a really wonderful nervine medicine, um, just helping to calm people. It's used in our tea blends. Well, I prefer that the oat, oats don't lodge and fall over, so I stiffen, strengthen the oat plant nutritionally, and I don't know how I got here talking about oats because I'm supposed to be talking about microbes, but that happens. But you, you get the idea. That I'm, uh, this is... A, relevant to so many different crops. So anyway, another source of effective microbes is SCD probiotics in St. Louis. Um, again, it's the same groupings. They can't use quite the same language because the other company has trademarked that language. Um, they, I think they refer to their products as probiotics for plants. You can make compost tea. But again, there's, there's many ways to go about this, but just understand why am I spraying some biology to reinforce that canopy colonization, to increase diversity. In the Korean natural farming movement, you'll see on the web ways of cultivating forest organisms that you can apply to the tea. There's, there's another way to do it in the Indian subcontinent. I mean, it's, it's different. when you go back to traditional agriculture, this is, we're just picking up the pieces that were left go for 100 years. People have been doing this, working with this for a long time. Today, um, we're also discovering, like in orcharding, there's new biology products you can buy which are specific organisms, and, and they use the term bacteriophage. That that's basically means a coating of bacteria, and, and that's the guardians, so that when fire blight bacteria 
land on that flower or on that torn leaf surface, they can't get in. When citrus canker is an issue, if you're down growing citrus fruits, it's about microbes and restoring that friendship, that alliance between plants and microbes. So very briefly, because we just don't have enough time, I better quick it, pick up the pace. Um, you know, facing our fungal fears. So now we're, we're going back to where we've been, thinking conventionally. And in thinking conventionally, we know that scab happens. We know that late blight occurs on the potatoes or the tomatoes and we lose the crop. So we don't see any of that. And back in the mid 1800s, some French grape growers decided they were tired of people just thinking they could come in off the highway and pick their grapes, so they sprayed them with copper sulfate and made them really blue and metallic tasting. And then they discovered that, hey, we don't have as much of that black spot disease anymore. Maybe this copper stuff works. And so they combined it with hydrated lime, and that was called Bordeaux spray. You probably have heard that term. And from there, we went on to discover all other sorts of materials, from sulfur to EBDC fungicides to stilorobins and, and all this chemistry again, aimed at killing the source of the disease, the pathogen, but without an understanding of what else we were doing. And so this notion of cleaning the slate, we do that in our own human medicine too. We overuse antibiotics. And, and if you really want to get sick, <laughs> you take antibiotics. And there, there is one out of 20 times is a good reason to take antibiotics. So I'm not disking that. And then you go into a hospital where you don't have any of your organism friends and all the potential pathogens in your county are like concentrated right there in the hospital. That's, that's a perfect plan to find your demise. Anyway, <laughs> that all comes out of the clean slate mentality. So when we talk about the fungal kingdom, we have the mycorrhiza fungi, so many things they do for plants and for us. We have the sapotrophic fungi that break down organic matter. The arboreal fungi, these endophytes and these epiphytes that I've been talking about. And then at the bottom, the pathogens, the parasites. And when we medicate for that 3, 4, 5% portion of the fungal kingdom, it impacts everything else that's going on there that's really meant to keep the plant healthy. And this particular slide is interesting. I showed it yesterday. It shows a cedar apple rust spore, and rather than having to punch its way into the leaf cell, cedar apple rust, most rust diseases do this. So if you're working with a crop that gets rust, tune in. Um, actually, those spores prefer to land on the underside of the leaf where the hyphae goes in through the stomate, not through the micropores, but actually in through the stomate. Um, and you need biology, bacterial gardening, um, bacterial guardians around those stomates to change that dynamic. This is almost a non-orchard thing. I, I was just thinking, yes, this is vegetable, potatoes. But then in, in France, this would be called pomme de terre, the apple of the earth. So I, it's hard for me to get away from apples, even when I try. Um, back about 10, 12, maybe it's even a little bit longer now, there was this incredible bioterrorism event that took place definitely on the East Coast. I don't know how much it came into the Midwest, but I think it did, where tomato plants were sold at the big box stores. And those tomato plants had all been grown in one or two greenhouse, huge greenhouse nursery operation down somewhere, I think, in South Carolina. And every one of those tomato plants came inoculated with late blight spores. The, the late blight is what caused what's known as the Irish potato famine. So normally spores have to get around by means of the wind and it's not a whole like continent that gets it. But here through these box stores, were sent these plants infected with a very serious disease. And, and even if you started your own tomatoes from seed and grew your own transplants, now spores are blowing in from just the next yard over. And, and, and so it was a summer where there was a serious infestation of late blight and it also, not just tomatoes, but also potatoes. And 
you know, up in New Hampshire, extension people, and I think this is true elsewhere, and I'm not picking on extension people, um, but they were saying, you know, you got this one fungicide, I'm not even going to try to say that name publicly, uh, or you got copper if you want to do it organically, and, and you can do two, three applications just to while away a few weeks before your plants die, but essentially the plants died. A lot of people were not successful with tomatoes and potatoes. Um, and again, even if you grew your own seedlings and you didn't have the infection spores in that soil, um, it came in on the wind because it was, had just been spread so universally. When I spray my orchard, I spray my potatoes, my tomatoes, I, I spray the garlic, I spray the beans. It's, you know, it, it's, it's not like I'm spraying because I have a pest or a disease. I'm spraying just to build health everywhere. If, if you came by on, on my spray day, I would spray you because I know it's good. <laughs> when I talk about compost, I spray my compost piles, the same mix, because fatty acids are fungal food. I'm, I'm trying to make a fungal compost. So again, I'm just so shifting the paradigm of how we think about spraying. Um, in working with this holistic core recipe, um, you passed out the handouts or not? Are you going to do that? Okay. <laughs> You're actually going to get a handout that, that's going to detail some of, of these things I'm giving you. Uh, in working with the Holistic Core recipe, and if I didn't put it in that handout, I have that details on my website in terms of the rates for a five-gallon backpack and also a hundred-gallon tractor sprayer. Um, you know, we're, another piece of the puzzle is providing trace minerals at opportune times. So I go about that in various ways as a generalist cook. That means I put kelp meal on alfalfa pellets for a sheep in the winter because the kelp goes into the poop, which goes into the compost pile, and the minerals are being spread. I dust those compost piles occasionally with a soil amendment like azomite clay, which purportedly contains all the trace minerals from A to Z. I dust azomite clay on a, a garlic bed when I'm prepping the bed for planting. Again, it's just a generalist approach to providing trace minerals. Um, using biochar can be a, a great thing to launch a newly planted tree, but it's also a great thing to put into the compost. Um, I won't get into the depths of that. Next workshop, I'll do a little more. But the, the importance of trace minerals is they play a key role as enzyme cofactors in plant metabolism. So, so plants are photosynthesizing, making sugars, they go on there from there to, to make proteins. Protein synthesis goes on from there to make fatty acids. Fatty acid synthesis, if that's robust, going to make a stronger cuticle. That's protecting the plant. It's also going to lead to enough reserve energy to go on for the plant to make resistance metabolites. Now we're into that phytochemistry thing. We want that whole process to be efficient, and trace minerals are important there. When plants are doing specific things, like setting a flower, opening a flower for pollination, setting a fruit, starting to form seed. The plant has a higher need for these trace minerals and there's an opportunity to add trace minerals to foliar sprays at those critical points of influence. Now, I define this pretty exactly in terms of the orchard calendar, but if I was a market gardener, my approach would be more along the lines of every 10 to 14 days at the critical junctures of this plant or when disease might be getting, preparing to unveil itself, I just keep things beefed up. I'm adding nutrition, I'm adding microbes. It all has value to the soil as well as above. One of the ways to do that is use a product called sea crop, which is dehydrated ocean water. Um, another way is, and this is what I use, is a product from Advancing Eco Ag called Micropack. And, and this is a, a tonic formulation of these different trace minerals. So it, it's not high dosing, it's, it's just a little bit goes a long way to help the situation. Um, so you have 0.6% boron. You know, boron in excess is dangerous, it's herbicidal. But in this case, it's a small amount just to assist things. This is getting back to my idea that Part of my role as grower is to act as a steward, to, to provide both the nutrients the plant specifically might need, but 
but especially that arboreal biology, which does so much for me. Another element of my holistic sprays, I talked about the foliar feeding idea of, of spraying really early or late in the afternoon. Well, with, four, with three acres of orchard, it takes me four, five hours to get it all covered. And so I usually am finishing by late morning. I, you know, I'm not in that, quote, open stomate rule, uh, window. But my focus is more on, I want to get it on before the rainy period, before the disease spell. And I'd love for a day of sunshine to help that plant utilize photosynthesis to drive the absorption of those nutrients. And I know that those nutrients are going to be taken in on day two and day three because it's going to go through the biology. That really kind of lightens it up. You know, there's not this like, got to get it on now, got to get it on now. I can't take my daughter to school. Forget that. This is more important. It, it, there's, there's more freedom as you start to understand you're working with the microbes and they're there. They, they get depleted, you renew it, but they're there and they're helping the plant grow. So in, in the fruiting world, we deal with uh, various rots, particularly on, on stone fruits. And the whole rot thing, so you may not be growing fruit, but you've seen rots on strawberries, or well, that's fruit. You've seen rots on potatoes. You've seen rots on tomatoes. You're aware of rots. Um, comes down to really that waxy cuticle on the surface of the plant. And behind that waxy cuticle are the epidermal cell walls and spaces between those cells. And when I utilize foliar calcium, I beef up the strength of the epidermal cell wall and foliar silica forms what's called a phytolith between the cells. And so I, with a robust cuticle and beefed up cells and this phytolith between cells, that's what rots have to get through. That, that's the primary way that I can defend against rots taking out my crop. So one very simple way to do that, um, grape growers in Australia utilize a diluted spray of milk, one to 10, whole milk. You want the fats, it's not about skim milk, doesn't have to be raw milk, but whole milk, you want the fats. Um, some growers utilize whey. There is a protein in whey, ferroglobin, that in the presence of sunlight, this oxygen radical proves toxic to fungal spores. That's really simple, and you're just tuning into that. That milk can be added to a holistic spray. It, it, it all can be tank mixed together, bringing these things together. Another approach, and this is what I do, is using certain plants. So I'm going really fast here. These slides are going to be posted. You're going to be able to see them. Um, comfrey is a plant really rich in calcium. Stinging nettle in the green phase is rich in calcium and many other phytonutrients. Uh, in the seeded stage, nettle becomes very rich in silica. There's a plant in the wild called horsetail, aqu no, Equisetum arvens. And horsetail goes back to the time of the dinosaurs. You probably know where there's some horsetail growing. Uh, silica can also be found in stiff marsh grasses. It can be found in bamboo. It's, it's, it's not, I'm not locking in on specific plants here. It's just certain plants offer certain nutrients. And if I know how to brew a tea and let it sit for seven to nine days, that's not much you have to know about letting it sit for seven to nine days other than letting it sit. Um, I can take, get the nutrients out of the plant material and into the solution. And one of the things I utilize with this is I think, oops, sorry, it delayed, is at the same time, I grow hardneck garlic, so I take the scapes off, and, and we eat pesto, and the sheep get some for knocking back worms, but it, it's also about the fact that garlic helps move through a membrane. And by adding garlic scapes, the organosulf or compounds are going to help carry calcium into that epidermal cell wall. It's going to help carry silica into the cell wall between the cells. And I go about doing all this brewing in barrels now. I make fermented plant extracts. And your handout includes this recipe. So I have a calcium brew and a silica brew. It's really simple to do. And this is what the plant material looks like after it's been in that barrel for 
seven to ten days. All the greenness, the green goodness is out of it and it's in solution. And it's a question of straining it. I've learned from John Kemp at Advancing EcoAg that manganese chelate plays an important role here in terms of balancing out potassium so magnesium and calcium can better be taken up. And all of this stuff together, you know, there's, there's many variations on this theme, and I'll wrap up here. Um, a plant medicines you can utilize. One of the things that really motivates me here besides just saving money and, and how I understand how it correlates to natural health in the plant kingdom is also the recognition that we're in a changing time. Whether you're thinking peak oil or, or climate change, um, what's available to us today through market sources, through trucking, through Amazon drones, that may not persist. And we may have to learn a bit more traditional earth skills to grow crops in all the different places that we do. And in doing so, if we're working with the arboreal food web, here's another one, hops resins. In working with the arboreal food web, we're starting to work how nature works. And that's a pretty cool calling. So thank you.